and um, the need for the need for sports in education is now gone at the days when parents are all about academics. The tides are changing and changing very fast. So as a matter of fact here, I get students who are just a bit above average, but their parents are big on sports because they've seen people go ahead and get scholarships through sports abroad especially. And then after then, there's even a change in the child's academics. So um, that spurred me on to start kids sports, especially with the less privileged and grassroots sports. We have a lot of talents in the grassroots, go to public schools, but they don't have the privilege um, of doing sports in the right way and combining it with education. A lot of them even drop out of school. So first of all, for kids sports, you need to be in school even to be in kids sports. And then we drive the sports part of the talent. And then also I've noticed with the children I have in kids sports, there's a lot of talents. They play football very well, but when we get to the stage of you come talk to them, interviews, they can't, they are looking down, they, they can't present themselves. So over the years, this sports and education that we present has boosted their confidence. So sports and education, it boosts children's confidence apart from physical health, fitness. It gives them a lot of um, exposure into leadership. So I've, I've had children over the years that weren't speaking, that weren't talking, can now present themselves, take on leadership roles, especially when you say, okay, you're the captain of the team here. Um, just, you, you wanna give them that exposure, you're the captain of the team. And then I'm getting feedback from their schools because I also have connect with the schools that uh, she, I'm just an example of somebody, is now speaking, she is captain in the class, she is taking on roles that he never used to take. So sports and education, holistic education to me is sports and academics. So that's right. brief, yeah. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. And now I'm gonna invite Wale Odesonia to share his views as someone who's actually had a lot of exposure himself as a former student athlete um, who played football and you know had the privilege of enjoying a scholarship himself and is now in a position to actually help other players help other student athletes as well as you know you do a plethora of different things in sports education in addition to your role as um, a project lead in integral so do you want to just you know share with us your opinions on really why is that why has there been i would say um a hesitancy to really go deep into sports education why is nigeria not well known for sports education we're known for our talent but it's not a destination for you know developing your game let's let's put it that way so what can we do to address these issues that schools are having i would say Okay, um, hi everyone, Wale Odesoya, as Beverly mentioned. Um, I, I would say, and I mean, to, to buttress um, Bukola's point, um, I think people are now realizing, parents especially, that um, an education is no longer just academics. Um, for a 360 education and a, a well-rounded holistic education, there has to be sports involved um, for many reasons um, so like Bukola said of course you know it, it puts you in a position to be more sociable uh, um, there, there's stats and there's data to to support the fact that you know student athletes um, do better now in class than they used to back in the day um, it helps them to understand things like time management um, increases increases their self-esteem um, helps them become better leaders and generally better human beings. Um, but back in the day, you know, my, my father used to tell me, especially because I was pursuing a, a professional career in sports, that his father told him that the people who, who played sports professionally were, were people who were failures, basically. And that, that was the agenda, or that was the, the story back in the day. But I've, I've now met a lot of parents, obviously, because of my job, who, who realize now that and who are willing to 
to kind of put the academics on the back burner and kind of allow their kids to, to pursue sports in whatever capacity that they want. I've met parents who've allowed their kids to have three, four, five years of, of five, five gap years in coach, you know, just so they can do or chase whatever dreams they have, you know, because for many reasons, one reason is that they, they hear how much, you know, these athletes are getting paid and they, they want a piece of the pie, of course. And, and of course, parents are more liberal than they used to be. They have, they allow their children make decisions, especially because it's their own life. Most of these kids are 18. And I guess, I guess it's the cool thing to do right now. Okay, okay. I, I like what you said about parents. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, I like what you said about, you know, the, uh, yes, the yes. attraction of the pay, the incentives, the financial incentives, which, which players can now, student athletes can now get. And correct me if I'm wrong, in the States, player athletes are now allowed to get endorsements. Is that correct? Player athletes can now be endorsed. Previously, they were not yes, allowed. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, now approve that. Yes. So, so those kind of things actually add to the attraction to 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 perhaps develop more, develop our, our players at a at a younger level, let so to speak. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Now, before we go to the next speaker, I just want to do a quick poll just to you know get a sense of um where you know what our views are really on sports education um we know what the good things about sports education are it's attractive scholarships um you know that overall holistic development but we're still not understanding why we're not participating as good as we can in sports education um, so, you know, let's ask a couple of questions. What are the biggest financial constraints affecting sports education? So far, people are saying, 50% are saying financial constraints. I think financial constraints tends to come up over and over again, regardless of the sector you're in in Nigeria. Finance is an issue. Infrastructure as well, lack of infrastructure. Right now in Lagos, for example, I'm, I'm, people might be tuning in from other places, but I think we've got like less than five major stadiums to a population of about 20 million. It's, it's, it's the, the ratio is really, really quite stark, you know, so you're thinking where can people train adequately and not just football, which by and large is, you know, you've got pitches coming up in different places. We're talking about maybe badminton. We're talking about tennis courts we're talking about swimming pools and that will bring me nicely to the next speaker we don't even have enough swimming pools access to pools is 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 pretty low lack of collaborators as well people are, are saying the, the the schools themselves why are schools not really collaborating enough with um with maybe sports facilities it could also be the financial constraints maybe they are charging too much Let's look at question two. Is sports education addressing gender inclusion and diversity? Well, it's we're a bit split. Half, more than half are saying yes. L slightly less than half are saying no. Th again, these are other questions that I'm gonna be asking the panelists to consider. Are you aware of multiple pathway opportunities in sports? 58% say yes. I'm gonna be coming back to um, Wale to tell us some of those pathways <laughs> that, um, you know, for the benefit of the 42% that don't know, should know. So I'm gonna bring you in, Adiruju. Thank you so much for, for holding on. I'm just gonna end this poll now. And, um, you know, you are one of the most renowned um, swim schools, uh, um, lead instructors and founders of a swim school. The first, I would say one of the first really properly well-established and well-run swim school. So, you know, congratulations. And you've been awarded multiple times, not just in Nigeria, but also internationally. Now, I think the question I'm gonna to put to you is, this issue of infrastructure, you're, you're a swim, you, you run a swim facility. Yeah. You know, how, how, um, how important is this issue of infrastructure on sports education? 
Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Amaka, it's really great. Um, yeah, I'm sure. looking, you know, I'm very excited about this summit. I remember the very first one. It was really, <laughs> it was a really good one. It was very enlightening. And again, thank you for all you do in promoting the sports industry and the professionals that run the sports industry. Um, you said it, we don't get enough um, airtime. So thank you for doing um, all this. So just a brief introduction. My name is Adiru Jokoyajai. As Amaka has said, I'm the founder and the lead instructor of Dolphin Aquatic Center and Dolphin Swim School. Dolphin Aquatic Center is our facility that we're hoping to build very soon in Lagos. Um, it's going to be a standard world-class swimming facility. But right now we're running Dolphin Swim School, which is um, one of the, the first swim school in Nigeria that is, has all female um, swim instructors and we cater to women and children. Our aim really is to ensure that as many women and as many children as possible are water safe and they are given the opportunity to, you know, swim and swim competitively. So that brings me to your question of infrastructure. I'm, I'm sure you have, we've had several discussions about the state of infrastructure, sports infrastructure, not even just swimming in, in Lagos and in Nigeria. It is very, very disheartening because we find that, you know, there are lots of interest. However, we don't have enough you know, um, infrastructure to support this. We find that we have to struggle with the few that we have in terms of maintenance, in terms of accessibility, in terms of, you know, even structure wise. So even as a sports business owner from that end, it's a tough one, you know, running a, a proper sports education business. Because again, what we do, we teach swimming as well as, you know, help competitive swimmers, you know, be better. Even in that area, it's hard because maybe you're setting up in a particular location and you have people that are interested and that commute alone is enough stress. I'm sure several times you've had to take your children to stadium early in the morning, all the way from the island to stadium to ensure that they get to swim in a standard sized pool. We don't have that apart from Teslim Balogun um, in in National Stadium. I mean, sorry, National Stadium swimming pool. The only other one is Teslim Balogun. But right now, the only functioning 50 meter pool that we have is at the National Stadium. There are other several 25 meter pools that some schools have magnanimously built. But again, they don't exactly give access to other people that might want to use it. So yes, infrastructure is a major thing. It's a major loophole it's a big big um constraint that we have to face as sports business educators and sports business owners um i think you know it's we can do better um so that's i guess maybe where we have to then explore private and public partnerships you know where we're working hand in hand with the government to ensure that we are building these kind of things which is what we want to try and do you know, we don't want to do it by ourselves and just keep it for ourselves. We want to be able to, you know, engage the government and see how they can come in to make this at least available. Because if it's there, people will use it. And then the 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 um, the sports education will definitely permeate into a lot more areas and a lot more people will have access to it. Hmm. OK, so you've you've mentioned a lot of things. You've talked about that need for private, public, perhaps um, collaboration. But then something that I want to explore and perhaps, you know, mention to all of you is there's a lot of focus on, oh, we need the government to partner more with private sector. But how about we begin to look at private equity? So in, the, in other industries, you've got the fintech industry constantly, mm -hmm. you know, talking about raising multiple series of funds. Um, yes. Series A, Series B, C, and so on, all the letters of the alphabet. Now, I know in the States, sports business has really gone to another level. We're talking, they've really boosted, you know, sports as, as a destination for investment. We're talking yes. private equity firms are now coming in to, to um, you know, to boost so many different types of projects. In fact, we're also looking at private individuals, perhaps successful ones. You, you hear about, um, I think, um, the likes of Beckham, Serena Williams, etc. They are now investing into 
other sports they're also investing into academies you know it's pretty pretty exciting so has, is it something maybe i'll pose this question to to bukola is this something that we should perhaps look at for sports education you know we we have the masses one benefit we have as africans is we are the youngest continent in the world i think over 50 percent i think you know, 30 percent of our population is made up of young people so we have the masses we have the numbers and sports is a game of numbers as you know so why are we not seeing more private sector internal collaborations i mean you said you work for uh, ais as well american international school um why are we not seeing more of these sort of organic collaborations everybody is always waiting for the government one thing about sports i found is we always we're always quick to call the government but then you know we can do things without the government's intervention like the entertainment industry took off without the need for the government to get involved so for sports education if it's really about you know harnessing our talent from a young age you know what other modes of support do you think we could be looking to because i'm sure there's other people on this call that might also be in sports business that might have academies feeling discouraged what would you offer as a suggestion to anyone who wants to you know start off their own academy or club or and is worried about financing okay um so i think um like you have said we used to rely a lot on government, but now, just as you've mentioned, I think more people are looking at the private equity partnership. Like um, I see it in Nigeria, UK doing that kind of thing already. And then let me go back to something you said about other opportunities in sports. So they are not just training students athletes, they are also training them in other aspects like coaching, um, the health part of sports. So they're, they're expanding the children's view. So I see a few um, people coming up with that. So just like the entertainment and fintech industries, I think we're coming up, we're just a bit slow, but I think once we get the hang of it now, we will. And also um, for AIS now, I see a few parents uh, and experts who are interested in supporting Again, it's been at the right place at the right time, knowing the right people. So we need to network right. So we get this kind of partnerships. And then, um, yes, we have the numbers, but then how is the number, how is it relevant globally? How are we making it relevant so that I can meet someone in the States and say, this is what we have, this is what we have, can we partner? I think that is where we need to get to make it a bit more marketable, to make it very, very enterprising and marketable for someone abroad globally to say, okay, yes, we want to be part of this equity or partnership. So I think it's a process that we have to learn and go through and this kind of summits help that. So right now it's got me thinking, okay, why can't we? Because I was really impressed when um, I heard Serena wanted to buy into Chelsea. I said, see, see, see how far we've gone. I mean, sports has gone globally. I mean, yeah. So when I even heard the gist of Dangote wanting to buy us now, I said, okay, yeah, this is kind of what we're talking about. When the interest is there, the hunger is there, then we can, we can. So we need to do some work in making it more palatable for private equities to, yeah. Like you said, when the interest is there, the hunger is there. Perhaps, you know, we need to feed that hunger more. Perhaps, you know, we're thinking small. Maybe sports industry as a whole in Nigeria, maybe not speaking for Africa wide, but at least in Nigeria, we need to think a lot bigger. So, I think so too. Coming to Wale, Can I? you work for Integral. Um, you do, you have, I mean, partnerships is something you're used to. Uh, you partner quite a bit with um, foreign foreign brands, foreign names. How, what, what, what are you doing? Do you just want to give us a flavor of some of the work you're doing as far as sports education is concerned? Or if you're not doing it yet, what kind of projects do you have on the horizon when it comes to sports education? And, and if you could make a wish, what would you want to change? What would you drastically change about sports education in Nigeria? So that's a two-pronged question for you. 
Um, so I think a few years ago, I, my, my colleagues on this call as well, on this yeah, call as well, uh, we, we realized that because of the kind of athletes we were dealing with, I will not mention any names, but we realized that the aspect of their lives and their careers they're actually missing out on is the education. They don't know, because they don't know certain things, they don't know, for instance, when someone is trying to be cunning with them, someone is being direct with them, they don't even know the rules of the game or the rules of the business of sports. So we realized that the education aspect was lacking a lot. So one of the first things we did is we partnered with um, um, Dr. Ekut Sogut, who is um, Mesut Ozil's agent. Um, we, we have a partnership with them in oh, Africa. Wow. We brought him into the country because he's a teacher genuinely and like that's really what he does aside from the, the business part of managing Ozil and brand endorsements and his businesses and the commercial side of things. Um, so we brought him, for instance, to speak to, I think we, we spoke to about over 100, 150 students at Unilag. Um, he spoke, yeah, he also spoke to some, some kids at the stadium, maybe over 200 or 300 of them. And what we realized is that we need to teach them from a very young age that aside from the actual football, there's so many aspects of sports that they need to be in tune with. So um, I think Bukola mentioned as well that there's a, there's a whole ecosystem and a whole value chain and that even if it doesn't work out in the playing parts, you can do so many other things in sports. So we realized that and then we, we, we've been thinking of how to kind of bring, for instance, coaches together, uh, bring players together, but we have so many challenges with the players, for instance, when the players are getting there, they think they know everything. It's hard to speak to them. I I, I have friends who manage big time professional Nigerian athletes. Okay. They cannot tell them what to post on Instagram. They cannot advise them that this is the right way to do things. And, and it's very obvious. Everyone is doing these things. And if you see the number of Nigerian athletes, for instance, who have brand endorsements, they are not like footballers in the national team, they're not up to five. And it's for a reason we're trying to teach you, and this is not the way to go, but it's hard to speak to this kind of people. Um, so we do we do a lot of things like that, and we're trying to see if we can set up um those sort of um educational gatherings where we can teach people, but that's one aspect. I'm sure you're you're aware because we, we've now kind of gone into business with each other that we run a program called um, College Prospects of America now, where it's strictly student athletes. So guys who have graduated, or guys and girls who have graduated secondary school have the opportunity to, to kind of further their education in the United States on scholarship. So we are very, very, very big on education, mostly because of personal experience, you know, dealing with these athletes. And we just want, literally, we want the landscape to be better. We want Nigerian athletes to be able to speak well in the media, to be able to communicate well, to be able to even understand the business side of things. And that's what we're working on. And hopefully in the next few weeks, now that COVID has kind of calmed down or now that we understand it, then set up things like that to help Nigerian athletes generally. I mean, yeah, I think what you said about, um, yeah, that cross, that cross exchange, you know, students, I think one thing I love about us as people, as Nigerians is we're very aspirational. We want a better life. We want a better education. Generally, we want the best of, of things for ourselves. And education is, the conventional education is something that most of us generally want. So that combination of a conventional education, you get your degree or your, um, or your um, what's it called your vocational course and at the same time you can continue to play your sport so whether that's tennis or football or swim that's something that you know I it would be great to see more of you hear of the famous academies like IMG in the States which have produced so many different stars um, 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 at global level in tennis and one thing they do there well is they make sure that your education continues, but there's a lot of focus on getting your technique, building you up, like you said, Wale, just preparing you for the world of sports, not just from a player's point of view, but from the business side. 
you know, we find that still too many um, athletes are not properly prepared. They go in, they so their agents focus too much on um, on the playing and very little on the etiquette, on developing a, a wholesome person that can that can be equipped to survive in that world because it's it's a world that can change your life dramatically if you if you're the one percent or the two percent that make it you're talking about a completely different change of lifestyle and everything and there's not enough support and education on even wealth management i mean that's a whole nother topic so i really like what you said about the work you're doing to help continue the education of talented player athletes because the brain drain and the talent drain from Nigeria is alarming and whilst we do want to support you know their their um, their endeavors and their dreams how do we you know I think how do we also develop a, a, a buoyant local market where we don't have to go abroad I mean that might be a long shot or that might be a 10-year plan but maybe I'll come bring this back to Adiraju it, in terms of education what can we do to stem the talent drain? So everybody wants to go abroad. Everybody wants yeah. to play abroad. You know, Miss um, um, Inkechi Obi had a very, very valid comment in a group chat today where too many clubs and academies are focusing on if I just sell five, I'm okay yeah. for the year or for two years. Yeah. How do we have a more buoyant local sports education that would ultimately support a, a more buoyant sports ecosystem. Thanks, Amaka. I believe that it's actually structure, 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 structure. Um, Wale and Bukola have spoken about, you know, and you as as well have spoken about how we can, we need to get funding. People will not fund what they don't understand or people will not fund what is not structured. So um, the bottom line for me, or the bedrock to having a robust, you know, reducing the exports, having great um, infrastructure, having people come in and invest in what we do in Nigeria is having structure. We find that even, and it's, it's permitting everything. We find that even as sports business owners, we struggle with that. Um, you know, speaking, I, you know, I've gotten some grants and me getting those grants had to, I had to be structured for me to get those grants. There was no way those grants would have come my way if I didn't get have any form of structure. So I think, you know, what I mean by structure in terms of, you know, um, how is the business running? How is this your um, sports business running? What is the um, thought behind it? What are the processes? What are the policies that you have in place? What are the, who are the collaborations that you, what are the collaborations that you have made you know, who are you speaking with? Who is your target market? Do they know you? Do they, you know, are you certified? Do you have all the necessary licenses to be able to do what you do and offer the kind of quality um, education that you want to offer your athletes? I assure you, because if we have that, then people are more confident to stay and, you know, manage the process. And they're more confident to like, okay, these people know what they're doing. I, I trust them. I trust my career. I trust them to help me take me, uh, my career to the level that I want it to be. Do you understand what I mean? But if that is not in place, then there's really no trust. People export because there's lack of trust, really. They don't trust that they will be able to achieve those dreams and I'll be able to play and achieve, you know, and compete in those amazing events if I stay here. But if that trust is reinforced or is reinstated or is created, then people can stay and it all starts from structure you know you, you brought something out from what you've just said the trust issue is there in our local system and yes. a, a valid point you raised is the lack of opportunities to play enough to even develop your talent and i know this was an issue particularly in the women's game in football where you've got talented women but they don't have enough opportunities to play. And I think that's why CAF um, set up a whole new program on the women's game, but I won't go into that because there's another panel on that. But what you said about, you know, okay, let's even look at under 15 
cutting across various sports. Let's look at athletics. How many opportunities do we have realistically for primary school children to, to, to compete in athletics apart from inter-house sports? How many? Swim tournaments, football, um, um, badminton, netball, and the list goes on. What you've said now is, oh, um, people who are privileged enough, I guess, to take their kids away and, you know, move to another country, they often say, well, we don't have enough opportunities to play. I want my child to play on a world stage, whatever that means. So you've raised a valid point about um, there's not enough opportunities. So I'm going to go back to Bukola. How can we... I mean, because we don't want to come away from this conversation feeling like we haven't addressed any issues. Realistically speaking, if we wanted to have more opportunities to even have, I don't know, athletics um, games, how can we address that? How can we have more competitive opportunities for our younger ones? And I'm talking even primary school level. That's for Bukola. Um, so this is really a problem, um, apart from football, I think, because you can really play football anywhere. You just need small space and then you can even use um, shoes to make goalposts. Almost every other sport suffers for it, like even for AIS here, we never get schools to play volleyball with the local schools. We, we never get so... Um, I think it will take um, people like us to go to the schools to start maybe mini um, leagues and tournaments. For now, that's all I can think of because um, I've thought of it, especially for basketball and the problem of volleyball, because I felt really ashamed when a Nigerian school came here um, and said they could play volleyball, but everything was off. I was like, this is not good. So like you said, we need to even start from primary school. Again, look at the school calendars. As sports organizations and sports and development people, we need to be able to go to these schools and say, okay, can we run these programs for... Because apart from football, they, even the schools themselves don't know the opportunities that come with every other sport. How many schools even know netball? I mean, they know it, they teach in... PE maybe just as a, okay, these are different sports, but practicality of it, have they? Even in their PE classes, what do they do in PE? So it's a thing that, that that's, would take collaboration between the schools, school administrators, coaches, PE teachers, and us. Valid. So really, again, that message of collaboration is trickling back. You know, schools, are they playing each other enough? Um, are we focusing too much on one particular game? Are we spreading out the, 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 is there a balance of interest between volleyball, football, netball, handball, athletics, etc.? So it's almost like we're having to take this question back to the, the schools and say, maybe we need to prioritize. Maybe there's a prioritization issue. Sorry, um, can I also say something? Sorry please, to cut you. No. Okay, and some of the schools, the problem is lack of infrastructure. Okay, so they don't have a basketball court where the kids can even say, or oh, you want to say, I want to teach the kids. Okay, this is the line, this is, they don't have that space. They don't have a lot of things. So again, for some of these schools, infrastructure it is the problem. Can I also add, you know, so for us to even do that, that means then the, the schools that would like to play with these schools maybe have to then try and think of building something for them. Do you understand that additional um, cost to that, you know, so that they have the, they have the facilities as well to help them even understand the sports. Okay, I'm conscious of the time and I really wanna get, um, you know, some intervention, some comments from the, from the audience. So I'm just gonna check out what's being said in the chat because we've got only about, I think we've got 
about 10 minutes left and I, I want to get comments from the audience as well as last comments from each and every one of you. You've been so brilliant. So Ismaila says, this has been an interesting session so far. Oh, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A and we can address your questions. So Ismaila says, this has been an interesting session so far. I would just like to say this. In as much as we try to encourage people to invest in the sector, we can't completely factor out the effect of government policy. Maybe that's something we should I should have brought up directly and indirectly. We've seen many government policies that have killed wonderful private startups and investments in this country. The truth is, government institutions aren't being honest and always find a way to frustrate private investors. I think this is one fear that keeps private invest keeps investors away. That's true. So I guess that's an overall macroeconomic issue. That is a macroeconomic issue. And it, of course, trickles down and affects the, the individual um, sectors. The se sports sector is a very big industry and the government still has a role to play. I kind of agree with you, Ismaila. There's a kind of foundational bedrock that needs to be put in place. And then private sector can go and, and do what it needs to do, but without policies agreed there's nothing to build on so i kind of understand what you're saying i'm just moving to the q a now amobi Eziaku, one of our panelists in the upcoming in day two thank you so much for the great discussions and he says how do we work around government policies that do not move in line with what investors want okay very interesting questions but i almost feel like it's <laughs> it's moving us slightly away from um the core topic, which is sports education, because the next session coming up is commercialization of sports in Africa. So I want you guys to hold on to some of these questions, if you don't mind. I really want to address specific questions on education. Education in Nigeria, is it doing enough to harness our local talent? Is edu uh, In fact, I can even say, to to, to, to to you um, panelists and, and maybe you will agree with me or not. Some of the schools, the quality of some of the schools we now have are questionable. You now have schools that don't even have grounds. You know this, you know this because land has become so expensive. And in fact, land has become so expensive that that in itself has become a barrier to invest into sports not to talk of education like bukola said some sports are easy like football you can find a pitch somewhere although now we need to address quality pitches as opposed to just playing on tarmac but there's certain things that you cannot um, um you cannot compromise swimming for instance you cannot compromise on the quality of a swimming pool i'm sure adiraju will agree you will you 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 encourage uh, illnesses people will become sick safety you know safety of the person even death so i think that issue of infrastructure keeps coming back okay i'm going to go back to the q and a Okay, Amobi says, with respect to sports education, do we think that the absence of intentional health and PE sessions we used to have in the past is a factor? Shell cups, primary school games, the academicals, who can take this question, please? A very valid question with regards to, yeah. Let me attempt it. Okay. So, um, definitely, I agree completely that um, it does have it is a factor because again i remember um you know as, a, as an athlete myself there were lots of competitions that we used to do for swimming there was the jk roundo swimming competitions the state competitions the schools themselves however bringing it down back now we find that you know infrastructure is playing a role because those swimming pools that we had access to then um what 20 years, 20, 30, you know, those kind of, those, those, infrastructure, those, those pools and the infrastructure are most likely run down now. And then you find that there's no continuity. You find that, you know, people that then watching their costs. So you find then that, you know, companies that would normally sponsor such events would rather put it in something else. So would rather make it, put it in maybe, um, uh, was it entertainment as opposed to sports? I think we just need to bring it back. We just need to 
sell the attractiveness of sports because really all sponsorships, most sponsorships and all these things go into the entertainment sector as opposed to sports. But there are a few companies that are coming back, you know, so we just need to really, really push it. We need to push, 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 keep pushing. Even if you hear a no, go back and just ensure that, you know, people are more aware that indeed sports is a major um, factor to promote education. Thank you for that intervention. Um, Amobi, I hope that answers your question and to perhaps the other uh, members of the audience. Sports is a major facet um, in, our, in our sector. I mean, most of us, you know, are involved in sport in one way or the other, either as uh, from an amateur level or a professional level, obviously the majority of us on an amateur level. And, um, you know, we need to just engage more. We need to find more solutions to help you know incorporate and engage these um these issues that we're not currently looking at eo says there are different eseosa olotu thank you says there are different factors affecting sports education in nigeria the key one being that there has to be a deliberate collabor collaboration between the government and private sector in developing sport in our schools it's expensive to have those facilities yes we've talked about the infrastructure um, um, challenges and it will require funding to build those structures and um, again there's the place of government in establishing such facilities okay yes we expect the government to do the minimum so have at a minimum like your major stadiums you're not going to expect a private individual to build like the equivalent of a Wembley stadium for instance so there's certain things we should expect government to have and then private sector just has to get involved I mean without wanting to go into the commercials too much a great example of trying to you know to to meet some of those goals could be private individuals you know using naming rights to raise funds so you know you 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 partner up with with um say a company that has a lot of funds i mean not i'm not like necessarily supporting crypto i'm kind of neutral on crypto but i'm sure many of us have noticed that right now Every, every sports tournament you see, www.crypto.com, Formula One over the weekend in Miami, crypto was bold over the, over, the, um, over, the, over the tracks. You know, most sports now, football, I'm sure we saw AFCON. I'm sure there was Bitcoin flashing along the banner. So there's a new breed of investors right now. And perhaps sports needs to kind of align more and there's those issues of when you're dealing with children, obviously you need to be mindful about the ethics and the optics. You can't have like gambling, um, um, you ha can't have gambling sponsors, you can't have drink sponsorship. So it's kind of limited when it comes to sport education, but there's still a lot more um, industries perhaps we need to look to like FMCGs. Now, I just want to use this opportunity to ask every panelist now to just share some some final comments on you know let's speak optimistically what do we want let's not speak from a point of view of oh well it's not going to happen if we could have one thing change in sports education oh i've still got some more questions coming in okay let me just take victor's thank you so much i love this i'm learning but how do we make sports inclusive talking about disability i love this okay could one of you please address um, gender and inclusion in your in your final um, answer? Maybe I'll I'll give that to Wale because I really wanted this to be a gender balanced panel. So you know I got women and the men. So Wale, your closing um, comments and do you have anything to say on um, you know sports being for everyone, including um, people who are less able bodied? Thank you. Okay, so um, very quickly, I'm just going over the question again. Um, so, again, in, in, in trying to run or be the industry leaders in quotes or pioneers in, in, in sports, we realized again from a very early stage that, you know, we, we have to, to kind of get the women involved as well. Uh, I wish not I was here. She's head of women's sports, but um, we have a few um, female athletes on our books, and they are doing amazing work. And it is it would be naive and very silly 
to not recognize how fast, for instance, the women's the women's aspect of sports is growing, not just in Nigeria, but just all over the world. In terms of disability, it's kind of a challenge for us because, because of the infrastructure. The infrastructure is lacking, so it's hard for us except you know we have a lot of financing to get into the disability part of of the inclusive inclusivity um it's a bit difficult but it's something that we're looking at and to make sure we carry them along especially because you know over the last couple of years in the olympics and all of the international games they have represented us the most they brought back the most medals and accolades so it, it will be very I mean, it is right now unfair to not carry them along and make sure that they are developing as fast as you know the men and and the women and you know so so I don't know I think it's something that we have to look at very seriously and I hate to bring the government into it because we don't even like to involve them but they have to acknowledge that in terms of inf infrastructure they need to help out so that we can carry them along as well. That's my final comment. Thank you and comments from Bukola. Um, sports education should be highly encouraged in school institutions. And so personally and each one of us personally should keep trying and doing, do what we're doing to push this forward. Um, apart from government, we as individuals, we should do our part in pushing it forward. Thank you. And Adiraju, last but certainly not the least, your comments. Yes, um, I think for me, I, it's very important that we do include um, sports in education because, you know, it has the power to provide learning values, discipline, building, team, team building, fairness, you know, equality, inclusion perseverance, respect, you know, all these things that we desire to have in our children. Sports actually do help them you know build these things so it's more more than ever essential to include it in our um education planning you know even as individuals private business owners and definitely we, as the, the government as well so yes we the sky is the limit we have we've not even started scratching the surface of sports education in nigeria there's so much more so much so much more but yes we just need the grace to continue. Yeah, we sure do. The grace, strength, and maybe some more strategies as well. Yes, Unfortunately, absolutely. I can't take any more um, comments, but I really, really love the, um, the engagement. Um, people really um, posted their comments, their ideas. People shared questions. I can't thank you enough. A massive thank you to our wonderful, wonderful panelists. You've been great you know you really brought out those touch points you shared your experiences and also perhaps you know your your dream and vision for you know a better landscape for sports education in nigeria so a very big thank you to you all we're going to be moving on now to the next session and i promise i'm going to try and sort out the video because we need to we need to engage with our panelists so please accept my apologies for not being able to see your beautiful faces but um, thank you so much. It's been great. And um, you can all log off now and prepare to log in for the next session, which is commercializing sports in Africa and more of those top issues on government policies, investments. We'll dig a bit deeper into those um, um, into those um, topics. So thank you so much for your time this morning. You've been brilliant. So I invite all the um, members of the audience to please log into the next. Oh, my God. Oh my goodness! Finally! Oh my goodness! Can we? Oh, can we take a picture, please? My goodness! Oh my gosh! Finally! Oh my god! Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh well, we made it work. I'm so sorry we didn't get to see your lovely faces, but we made it work. Can we just take a quick shot? Um, uh, let me figure. out How do I do this? I think it's Control Command. Give me a second. Let me check. I'm so glad we got to see your faces finally. 
Um, okay, let me just check how to do that. How to screenshot on a Mac. Control, control, command five. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> control, command. So everybody just smile and say sports education. <laughs> Did I get it? I don't think I got it. I've got too many. Sorry, things. shift, shift, command five. Sorry. Oh, thank you, darling. Shift, command five. Yes. I think I got it. I, I think. Yes, I did get it. Yes. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm glad we made it work. God bless. And if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, I know you have very busy days, but I invite all of you to log in to the next session, which is starting in three minutes. Take care. Bukola, Dereju, and Wale, you've been for having us. Bye. 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 Okay, um, right. So you can all log out now and enter the next session. Thanks so much, Max. Thank you.